This is your last chance. After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill. You wake up in your bed and you keep wondering how the monkeys are still running the insane asylum. You take the red pill. You subscribe to this channel. And I'll show you what good television actually looks like. Hi, my name is Nacho. Welcome back to my channel. And we've been presented with an incredible matchup that I've been wanting to cover since the moment their first episode premiered. Two companies that have the most ancient rivalry within the superhero genre both released a show almost at the same time last September, each one about a character that has some relation with a major name in their respective franchise, both considered to be supervillains, both introducing a whole new set of players as their entourage, and both targeted at significantly different audiences. The term superhero fatigue has been coined out multiple times at this point by several media articles, majority of times before and soon after the release of a disastrous superhero film that tanked harder than the Germans in circa 1940, that most of the time has a group of people in charge of making them, turning hundreds of millions of investors' money into an incoherent boring mess that they thought to themselves would easily make a billion dollars, after they handled the keys of this warship to a lesbian. Okay, that's not true. She didn't sink the ship just because she's a lesbian. She sunk that ship because she tried to reverse parallel park it. Jokes aside, the release of DC's The Penguin and Marvel's Agatha House of Harkness, I mean Agatha Coven of Chaos, I mean Agatha Darkhold Diaries, I mean Agatha and the Lion Witch and the Great Wardrobe, fuck, I mean Agatha, I mean Agatha all along. There. Don't worry guys, the multiple name changes were intentional and part of a meta joke. Right. Both shows have definitely challenged the superhero fatigue mythos and made a mark in their respective streaming platforms, with The Penguin topping the HBO charts with almost half a billion minutes watch, and Agatha... Well, it's getting there. But more than reviewing both shows, which would have been exhausting, the thing that drove my attention and the focus of today's video is how these two somewhat similar shows are experiencing different levels of success by targeting two very distinct audiences. The established superhero audience and the modern audience. Buckle up. Now to clarify before I get blasted in the comments, I know that despite their similarities, these shows are very different. One is a grounded Sopranos-like mob boss origin story, and the other one has witches, magic, and gay people. A lot of gay people. In the case of The Penguin, the story revolves around the character of Oswald Cobb, aka The Penguin, one of the most notorious villains in Gotham City, and his rise to power working with and against the other crime families of Gotham. Unlike my first experience with the character with the legendary performance of Danny DeVito in Batman Returns, oh good times, my. the aesthetics of Colin Farrell's Penguin are drastically brought down to reality. The amount of work in terms of makeup, costume, as well as performance from Farrell is incredible. It's borderline Tom Cruise as Les Grossman. Gary Oldman as Winston Churchill, or as Truman, or as Dracula. Man, this guy's good. Farrell is almost unrecognizable. Adding to that is the amount of vocal coaching he went through to further layer this iconic villain. My dialect coach, Jessica Drake, she has a library of thousands of accents from all over the world. And so there was a gentleman who was a manager of an apartment complex in the 80s. He was older, he sounded about 60 or so. And so whenever my accent started to go, she'd call me back and I'd say, gefilte fish. And that would kind of, it was just a little trick. Kristen Melody from How I Met Your Hangman gives another incredible performance as Sofia Falcone, with a whole episode dedicated to her origin within the world this series takes place. And it's another great example of a well-crafted female character. I really enjoy watching her, especially with the contrast this character has from her last major role. And to be honest, if she doesn't win an award with this, I have no idea how she will ever get one. Additional characters like Victor and Oswald's mother are great and balance out his characters, showing a softer side of him, if you can even call it that. Based on performances alone, this show is great, coupled with progressive story that doesn't take huge leaps of logic that leave you scratching your head, has good dialogue, clear character motivations, carefully constructed world building, which, to be honest, if you've ever seen any Batman content, you will know what Arkham and Crown Point are. It's hard for me to give any bad criticism on this show because it's really fucking good. Coming from watching Rings of Power to this, it's like going from the edible side of a 9mm Beretta to a delicious four course meal. You can tell how much effort went into the costume, the casting, and the writing. The creator, Lauren LeFranc, has a lot of experience with the genre, having worked a lot in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And the work they've done honestly deserves the level of appraisal they are receiving. 
That being said, it's easy to tell the sort of audience the Penguin is targeted to. It's a greedy and violent villain origin story within the DC Universe that caters to a large male audience, myself included, that tends to make comic book related content succeed. Now take all of that and flip it on its head and you got Agatha all along. The first question I can already read in the comments is what makes me so sure that Agatha is meant for the modern audience? And let's just say that one of the defining qualities of creators that make modern audience targeted entertainment is that they are never particularly subtle. Ugh, it really warms the heart. You don't have a heart. Yes, I do. It's black and it beats for you. Ha! Gay! To say that this show is targeted at middle-aged wine moms would be a bit reductive, if of course we disregard the fact that episode 3 is literally a bunch of middle-aged women drinking wine. Some of them might even have kids. Another big difference I noticed while watching both shows is how I looked forward for the next episode of The Penguin every week and how I literally forced myself to binge Agatha as quickly as possible to be able to make this video. Luckily it ended at the same time I was making this script, so now I can give a full breakdown of the show. Much like the latest couple years of Marvel content, Agatha all along steers away from appealing to the majority of its comic book fanbase by making, and I quote, the gayest Marvel show ever. But Agatha is the gayest Marvel project yet, do you agree? I, it better be, that's what I, that's what I signed up for. <laughs> Gay! Which is not exactly marketing gold, to say the least. I would say arguably the gayest Star Wars, I think, by a considerable <laughs> margin. <laughs> and it's something Marvel should know well at this point, considering the success of their latest gayest Marvel movies ever made. Can you imagine how many lives is this is going to be saving? Young queer folk. <laughs> Serious? But when it comes to the show itself, the first problem you run into very quickly is how much on your face some of this stuff is. The first episode is okay. It's basically a neo-noir detective drama that's basically an illusion in which Agatha is trapped in. And there are no major bad things about it. Of course, if you don't count the fact that they displayed a 40 plus year old woman bought us naked in front of a kid. I don't know what compelled him to do that to be honest. To give you an idea, Agatha is gay. How do I know that, you might ask? Hey, you want straight answers? Ask a straight lady. Also, the teen is gay. How do I know that, you might ask? Who's the querent? Uh, you mean the subject? Me, I, I guess I'm the querent. <laughs> what witch in her right mind would join Agatha Harkness's coven? <gasps> Sorry, he worries. <laughs> Intense feelings. They're gay, I get it! Yeah, they don't really leave much room for speculation here. Speaking of Teen, who's actually Wiccan, the son of Wanda, played by Joe Locke, who from the very get-go established himself as a very unlikable actor, like most queer folk do when they are granted the privilege of entertaining the majority male comic book fanbase. As he established in one of his interviews saying, Marvel fans are very open with their opinions, but they are not in a Marvel show, so... <laughs> I'm doing the one thing that they really wish they could be doing. It's true that the fans will always have comments, not always nice, regarding the force feeding that Disney loves to do regarding gay characters and actors in pop culture IPs. It is their right to do so, because as Henry Cavill put it, they are passionate about it and they want the best for what they love. I'm sure that Mr. Log was cast solely based on his acting experience and not at all because he's super fucking gay. But treating your fans with disrespect is a big no-no, my 45 kilogram Twinkie friend. Eat shit. The character of Wickham is not only the weakest one of the show, that until the last episode does nothing but fulfilling the role of an ego boost for the rest of the female cast, saying how great they all are at all times, and being gay. Like, super fucking gay. But the reveal that he's won the sun is also quite underwhelming, and he suddenly goes from being a friendly, harmless psychic that knows a bit about witches to a bigger threat than Agatha in search of his imaginary brother that Wanda conjured into existence. And who ends up being the key to everything in a show called Agatha All Along. I also find it funny how someone posted a pic of him next to Tom Welling. And honestly, what happened to good looking dudes in TV shows? I'm sure there are some pretty good looking gay guys out there. I mean, at least get someone with symmetrical eyebrows. 
Further nailing the fact that this show is not made for the audience that would pay to see your show. The premise of the whole thing revolves around the Ballad of the Witch's Road, which is sung. A lot. There's too many musicals in this for a blog to actually enjoy it. I mean, one of the trials is them basically beating a demon with song. Riveting stuff. The final episode, and this is a spoiler, is how Agatha lost her son, which was hinted that she exchanged him for the Darkhold, which she didn't, which makes you wonder how and why she got a hold of it to begin with. I mean, Wanda at least wanted to get her imaginary kids back. But no, here we see Agatha giving birth to a potential stillborn, judging by the presence of death at the time of birth, but she negotiates some time for the kid to be alive. The kid's name is Nick Scratch, given that Agatha mentioned how she made him from scratch, and I don't want to be that guy, but is this meant to signify parthenogenesis? You know, when the female of a species can have babies asexually, without the need of sperm, because nothing screams raging feminism more than that. Anyway, she goes along with the kid for about 6 years, feeding on witch's power and life using him as a means of attracting the unsuspected women. But then the kid dies and Agatha continues to do exactly that, with no major change for hundreds of years. She's just a bit sadder now. So in summary, the presence of the kid didn't alter her way of living in the slightest. She didn't try to get power to save him and cheat death, which she was more than justified to do so. She's angry at Aubrey Plaza for killing Nick later, but she never tried at no point to screw her over to save her son. So in terms of character motivation, the opportunity to give Agatha some depth on why she is an evil colorless bitch, which completely flew over the head of the show's creator, compared to the Penguin, that progressively tells you how Oz went from being a poor deformed kid from the projects to getting involved in crime and betraying everyone in order to get ahead and provide for his mom after his brothers died. It's a simple but understandable background. The most revolutionary thing about the finale of Agatha is not really anything relevant to the plot, but the fact that we had the first lesbian kiss in Marvel history, which was enough to light the queer Coomer's Twitter feed on fire. Between you and me, I love lesbians, and I strongly believe that House of the Dragon did it way better. I mean, you're telling me that Agatha and Rio used to date, but she dies if she kisses her? That doesn't make any sense. It it's not really of any help that unlike the Penguin, the lady in charge of creating this show has, well, a less than stellar resume. <laughs> now, I would be lying if I said that there's nothing to salvage about this show. Episode 7, which revolves around the story of the divination witch, Lillian, was actually pretty good. And it's one of the situations where a great actor, even with terrible material, can still carry a show on his shoulders. Patti LuPone does a great job in her standalone episode, which is why it's regarded as one of the better scored ones. The reveal of Aubrey Plaza as death was alright, strongly foreshadowed, but she does fit really well with the character, so that's also something to compliment. And that's pretty much all I can say about things that I liked about it. Don't get me wrong, this show is not necessarily bad, it's just a nothing burger that does not appeal to the dark demographic I could be included in. Much like The Acolyte, which this show shares a lot of similarities with, which if it wasn't for this channel, I wouldn't even bother to watch it. Because it has very little things that I found interesting about it. And I actually liked WandaVision. However, it's clear that the intention with making this show within the superhero genre was not to blow the charge out into space, but just to add more stuff to the Marvel's conveyor belt of shows. It's a very slow burn that doesn't get decent until way past the halfway mark. It was cheap though, I'll give him that. A reasonable 40 million for 9 episodes is not bad considering the cost of their previous flops. It's a show that from its inception was guaranteed to not achieve a lot. At least that's what I'm getting from it. Because according to media articles, this show is the best shit to ever happen to Marvel since the creation of the paper the comics are printed on. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up. So once again we come to the realization that despite the relentless efforts of modern companies to try to divert the flow of money and try to make more shit that appeal to the modern audience, which I'll say at this point and with the streak of failed products that were made to appeal to that audience, I would say we can even quantify how big it actually is. Just look at games like Concord, Dustborn, Unknown Nine Awakening, Dragon Age Valley Garden, as well as The Acolyte, The Marvels, The Eternals, the upcoming Ironheart spin-off. I can't believe they're actually going ahead with it. I'm telling you, they hate money. This is basically Iron Man, but does it come in black? And guess what? 
It already did. Appeal to that very small audience and you'll lose 9 times out of 10. Stick to what works. Target your actual audience by making quality products with lots of talent and dedication put into it and you'll get a comfortable number one spot at the top of the charts as well as lots and lots of money. The Penguin did just that. And for the people that made Agatha, well, they chose poorly. But if you watched this fine video, leave us a like. Check out this video next for more awesome content. And as always, happy night. Hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.